to our Caribbean and African targeted health improvement program, CAFIP Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for one of our Saturday Health Hours. My name is Ngozi Ediasage, and I'm the medical lead for the Caribbean African Health Network. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really delighted to welcome a really impressive double act. We've got Professor Dawn Edge, and we've got Dr. Lade Smith. Um, professor Dawn Edge is a professor of mental health and inclusivity in the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health at the University of Manchester. And Dr. Lade Smith joins us. She's a consultant psychiatrist at the South London and Mods, the NHS Foundation Trust, a visiting lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry. Now we've listened to your feedback. We know that many of you have asked us to do a session on mental health. And we know it's a concern in the black community because we know that African and Caribbean people are nine times as likely to uh, suffer with uh, psychosis. We know that there are lots of um, black people who end up being sectioned and we want to understand the reasons behind this. But also there's a lot of mystique um, surrounding the diagnosis of psychological and psychosis, um, psychotic illnesses. And we're hoping our guest today will help to remove some of that mystique and tell us how to handle problems like this in our society. So I'd like to welcome Dawn and Lade to this session and I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so good morning everyone and thank you. Good morning, good morning. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us to speak. Um, so um, I'm going to start off uh, by, and first of all I'm going to share my slide with you. So um, I am going to be talking to you about um, the uh, psychosis, essential psychosis and um, ethnicity, essentially. And what I'm going to be telling you about is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the issue is, particularly for black people. And then uh, I'm going to explain what psychosis is, talk to you about the history, a little bit about history. There's a lot of contention in this area, actually. This is when I get my slides working. Uh, there's a lot of contention in this area because uh, people have really concerned about some of the controversies. And, um, and then I'm going to explain to you what the reasons might be for what appear to be excessive rates of psychosis in the black community. So, um, I am just going to, okay, I'm hoping you can all see that, yeah? Okay, good. Okay. So the problem is this, there are really profound inequalities for black people, not just black people actually, pe 
any ethnic minority, most ethnic minority people living in white majority countries, when it comes to accessing mental health care, ex the experience of mental health care and outcomes of mental health care. And that's uh, particularly true for black people. So there's massive overrepresentation of black people in uh, mental health services. And unfortunately, if you are black and you end up in mental health services, you are much more likely to end up in crisis. Uh, you are much more likely to be brought into hospital via the criminal justice system. So that means via the police or, and um, you know being picked up off the street or coming from prison. You're much more likely to be brought in via A&E. To put that in context, when we have a health problem, what usually happens is that we go to our GPs and we say we've got a health problem, and the GP will then, uh, you know, refer you onwards. In fact, uh, if you're black, it's more likely that the police are going to bring you into mental health services. The other problem is that when people are in mental health services, uh, they're much more likely to be in the secure end or in the intensive care end. And rather unfortunately, although as black people were much more likely to be represented in crisis, much, much less likely to get the treatment that we need. And this is just a quick graphic to show that if you do manage to get into treatment, you're much less likely to recover than a white person will. And that's actually true for all ethnic minority groups. And in fact, um, you know, Asian people have some of the worst outcomes as well. So that's the context. And the thing is that it's said that one of the reasons why black people are much more likely to end up um, in hospital detained under section um, is because they're much more likely to have psychosis. And it's an interesting, interesting question about whether that's the case or not. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, the history of that and what's gone on. But before I do that, I'm just going to explain to you what psychosis is, because people often make the mistake of thinking that um, psychosis means being violent. And the re part of the reason for that is um, lots of incorrect media representations of psychosis. And um, people often will talk about someone being psychotic and referring to, some, to someone who's done some horrendous, uh, sadistic, violent crime. And uh, in fact, they're getting mixed up with psychopathy. So if someone's a psychopath, then there's an increased risk of them committing a violent crime. But psychosis actually means being detached from reality. And the way, it's, it, the way it manifests itself is that it manifests itself with delusions and hallucinations and sometimes thought disorder breakdown in, in um, the way our grammar and the way we speak. And it's really important to note that in England and Wales, there are about three quarters of a million people who have psycho psychotic illnesses. And most of those people are just going about their own business, causing no particular issues to anyone at all. You know, it's Mrs. Jones who lives at 10 Acacia Avenue in, um, you know, in Didsbury, and she thinks she's the Pope. Uh, you know, she works in the local Tesco's, but she, she thinks she's the Pope. No one really cares, actually. And a psychiatrist, we don't really care. If you're getting on with your life, you know, occasionally when you're at, um, you know, a family dinner, you'll mention the fact that you're the, cope, that you're the Pope and that, the, that you're communicating with God and that God has told you that, you know, you have to uh, minister to the poor, that's fine. As long as it's not interfering with your life. If Mrs. Jones starts to, um, you know, decides that, right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to work anymore, and she loses the job, and she can't afford to eat, or she decides I'm not going to eat anymore, because I'm on a fast to save humanity, and she stops eating, she stops drinking, and she becomes so physically unwell that she could die, then that's when it becomes clinically significant. So, when someone has a psychosis, they'll have, they might have delusions. And a delusion is a false belief, which is held with unshakable conviction, despite evidence to the contrary. And very importantly, it is out of keeping with the individual's cultural, educational, and social background. So that excludes religious beliefs. So we know that different people from different religions have very significantly different ideas about, about um, God, for example. So some people, some religions have, um, believe that there are many gods. Some people um, believe in a monotheistic, um, God, you know, there's only one God. And that wouldn't ever be a delusional belief because it's not out of keeping with their um, culture and educational social background. A hallucination, 
it's a perception occurring in the absence of a stimulus and it can be uh, you know so for example if I went out and you all saw me being hit in the face and you would understand why I'd reacted and, and I'd reacted as though I was in pain but if I said ouch and you hadn't seen that you know you'd, you'd there'd been you know I'd, I'd said ouch that's my perception of pain I'd felt someone hit me but none of you saw me being hit then that would be a perception in the absence of a stimulus and one of the typical kind of things that people talk about are auditory hallucinations so people are hearing voices when there's actually no one around in the room and there are lots of different types of hallucinations um, some of which are an indication of Ill, Ill health, some of which are just usual normal variants that happen all the time. And you can have hallucinations that happen in any modality. You, know, um, you can hear things, see things, uh, feel, feel things, you can smell things, you can taste things. And then there's formal thought disorder, and that manifests as a breakdown in the way in which you speak. So for example, I'm sitting here in my home in London and the sky blue, yellow and then the white walls are hitting me in the face so it would be some kind of breakdown in in your language which is a subtle thing may happen um it, it you know happens very quickly it may not last very long and it's something that um but it, again it's an indication it can be an indication of how severe a person's illness is there are different types of psychosis the five main um, umbrella types if you like so an organic psychosis is a psychosis. So this is, you know, has the features of delusions and hallucinations being detached from reality, when it, and it occurs in the context of some kind of underlying organic problems, such as say having a tumor sitting in your, uh, lim in, in your temporal lobe, just around the, your limbic system, which is where um, hallucinations and abnorm abnormalities uh, in our emotional perception arise. You can have depressive psychosis, so as depressive psychosis will be when someone is extremely sad and depressed and they become more and more and more depressed and the more and more, and more depressed they become, it's that they start to um, develop delusional ideas and sometimes hallucinations. And they can have such a severe depression that they develop a psychosis as a result of that depression. On the opposite scale, a manic psychosis is when someone is feeling really pretty good, they get, start to get high. That, um, you know, this happens in bipolar illness, they become extremely high, you know, they think I'm the king of the world, I'm brilliant, I can fly, actually, I'm sure I can fly, but, you know, when I walk into the room, everyone gets happy, I can fly, I'm like an angel, and then the person might jump off the roof, which is what happens when I meet people, and I've usually met them after they've jumped off a tall wall or something like that, and hurt themselves, and that's when it's become apparent that they have an underlying manic psychosis. The schizophrenia-like psychosis, which um, people recoil when they hear the term schizophrenia, uh, it's that manifests in a diff again another different way. There's more bizarre delusions and um, hallucinations, particular types of hallucinations that occur, and then there's drug-related psychosis, and this is the kind of psychosis that occurs when people, um, you know, go out on a Friday night, they stuff them, their faces full of ketamine and cocaine, and then. Um, you know, later on, they have a significant paranoid reaction. Uh, they think people are out to hurt them, that people have been replaced by alien robots, and they're terrified. Whilst the drug is in their system, they are completely psychotic. And then as the drug comes out of their system, things get better. And we usually call that a drug-induced psychosis. Just to say that we know that drugs can increase the, ri the risk of developing long-term you know severe and enduring psychoses and that's slightly different from the kind of problem where you take the drug it makes you psychotic and once it's out of your system it's gone so a bit of history there was a lot of controversy because uh, it was found in the kind of around the 1960s when there was large um numbers of uh west indian people coming to the uk to work etc um, it was, uh, it, people started to note that um, more and more West Indian people, like Irish people actually, who were also having a similar issue, were being brought into psychiatric hospitals, um, supposedly with psychosis. And uh, so there's some work that was done in, in by this time, kind of uh, 70s, 80s. And it was finding that if you were Irish or from a West Indian background, you were almost eight times more likely to be sectioned, brought into hospital under 
uh, detained in the section of the Mental Health Act than if you're a white person. And uh, there was people were saying, well, this must be because uh, black people and and and, um, and Irish people are gene- somehow have some genetic or biological um, predisposition to uh, developing severe mental illness to psychosis, and it's psychosis is a severe mental health problem. And Roland Littlewood and Morris Lewis have said, oh, we're not sure about this actually. We think that maybe there's something more going on here because um, in in these people's original, well, you know, their homelands where they come from, um, this, the, 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 they're not having the same kind of um, problems actually. It's always not, the problems occur, but not as severely. And we think what's going on here is that maybe people, the, the, the distress that people are experiencing is being somehow systematically misdiagnosed as psychosis or schizophrenia. And that's particularly the case with people who are black Caribbean. And then maybe it's that the clinicians, the psychiatrists are misinterpreting these symptoms. And, and in fact, there's, you know, or, or maybe the symptoms are being are manifesting differently. The symptoms of other disorders are manifesting differently. Fred Hickling, British psychiatrist, his Jamaican psychiatrist worked as a British psychiatrist, and they checked everybody to see if they, they checked some white people and black people to see if they came up with the same diagnosis or not, and they came more or less with the same diagnosis. Simon Fernando here said, actually, the problem here is that schizophrenia is a socio-political racist construct, and it's being used to malign minority groups, particularly black people, and by the way, psychiatry, it's, you know, Western, it's a Western specialty and it's inherently racist, full stop. More recently, Jonathan Metzl, an American, um, has written a very interesting book, Protest Psychosis, showing how in the kind of, you know, 30s and 40s uh, and, f- and 50s that in America, schizophrenia was a kind of disorder that was usually assigned to um, middle aged white women who um, you know, would just sit in a corner and a rather kind of sad and, and lacking motivation. And it was when um, you know, and their husbands would commit them to hospital. But as the civil rights movement um, came about, it, it began to morph and began, the, the diagnosis began to morph and include much more about aggression. And it was increasingly applied to black men and was a way of um, essentially taking black men off the streets and putting them into hospital. And so he's, you know, he's essentially written this book saying how schizophrenia became a, a black disease. So there's lots of controversy. And this controversy raged for years. Um, people saying black people have more psych- black, black people have lots more psychosis than white people. And other people saying, no, they don't. Black people don't have more psychosis than white people. Studies showed again and again and again that if you were black, you were much more likely to be diagnosed as having psychosis than. Um, someone who's from the white majority um, population. And that was particularly the case for countries like the UK, USA, Netherlands, etc. But interestingly, not so much in black majority countries. Um, we did some work uh, in the late 90s looking at racial stereotyping, and we actually found little evidence that the problems were starting at the point of the psychiatrist. And uh, it didn't seem to matter what your ethnicity was when it came to your diagnosis of schizophrenia. But what was striking is that over the years, very few studies looked at rates of other disorders like, you know, depression or anxiety or, or PTSD or eating disorders, for example. And um, it's quite hard. If you go looking, you'll find it quite hard to find out what the rates are of these disorders in black people. However, the raging debates were useful for something. And what would, they were useful for was um, it meant that there were huge amounts of research around psychosis and where I work at, in London at the Institute of Psychiatry in the Maudsley as uh, one of the main centers for looking at uh, psychosis research. And that psychosis research uh, meant that there was lots more understanding about psychosis. So what we know now is that there probably isn't a single cause of psychosis. In fact, we're pretty sure there isn't a single cause, but there's a range of factors that might combine to push an individual into psychosis. It's likely that there are different routes to psychosis. Genes do contribute to vulnerability, uh, and we also know that children who are born prematurely or suffer oxygen starvation at birth are also at higher risk. Heavy abuse of drugs such as amphetamines and cannabis is definitely associated with um, developing psychosis, and there's a range of early socio-psychological um, ad- adversities such as separation from a parent, being a migrant, growing up in a city, being particularly, you know, being persistently abused or bullied. 
they all increase your risk. And similarly, adverse life events and trauma can precipitate illness. And now this is just to show you that the developing psych um, mental illness is very complex, complex interplay of your biology, sociology, and uh, psychology. And, but very simply to say that genes are one, one problem, but perinatal factors, so that's maternal exposure to toxins and viruses, particularly important at the moment, and impaired fetal development and obstetric complications. And we know that if you are black, you're more likely to have perinatal difficulties, more likely to have obstetric complications because you might be more likely to have poorer antenatal care. That increases your risk of developing um, psychosis. But more than anything, mental health problems are primarily a result of trauma, adverse ex um, childhood experiences, and um, these factors, negative life events that occur later in life and very important poverty. I'm just gonna very quickly scoot through these things and say to you about genes, 1% um, of the population across the world has psychosis or schizophrenia. Uh, genes are important. If you have an identical twin who has schizophrenia, you've got a one in two chance of developing it yourself. It's pretty clear now that genes are not the reason why black people have higher rates of psychosis, because we know that second, third, fourth generation um, black people have higher rates than their parents. It, if it was genes, it wouldn't change quite so frequently. And if you go to other countries, black majority countries, the rates are about the same. Genes are not the reason. When it comes to biology, uh, we know that th there are things about inflammation, lead, drugs are really important. For sure, if you use cannabis regularly from your mid-teens, you will in that increases your risk of developing psychosis by about five times by the time you're 25. And that's because our brains don't start growing till we're in our late teens. And if you're a male, it will be early 20s in some cases. You are essentially, if you start making cannabis a joint a week from when you're 15, you are growing your brain in cannabis soup. We know that social factors are really important and your social situation in society affects your, how you are exposed to, to um, childhood adversity, how you are, your standard of living, that affects your health. And we know that the way, not only does it affect your health, it also affects how your body reacts to the um, thing that the various uh, uh, exposures that you might, that might be negative to your health, that affects the distribution of your physical and mental health. And that's Public Health England show that. This graph shows that poorer people in society have worse health. And interestingly, the poorer people in society include, um, in, certainly in, in the UK, um, people from minority ethnic groups, Black African, Bangladeshi, etc. You'll note at the bottom here, white British and Indian people who are pretty wealth, wealthy, similar levels of wealth. This is household wealth. And, um, and that's important because there is what when you disaggregate the data, you, you really interrogate it, you pull it apart. What you find is that, for example, with South Asian people, it South Asian people, that the progress that the Indian people have made is mass the ongoing really poor health outcomes of the poorer people who are Bangladeshis, poorer South Asians. And a similar thing happens in the black group. And we know that if you are poor, if you live in a deprived area, you will spend one third of your life in poor health. If you live in an affluent area, you only spend about a sixth of your life in poor health. Social factors are really important in developing psychosis and so is discrimination. And it's not simply that individually mediated, you know, racist name, calling psych, um, discrimination. We're talking about institutional and structural discrimination, but inaction in the face of need has been associated with the development of um, mental health problems, as has internalized discrimination. And this is a dull experiment by Kenneth and Mamie Clark from the 40s and 50s. You know, they gave two sets of children, um, this is like year one children, about six or seven, gave them two um, black children, white children. They gave them, um, they gave them uh, uh, a white doll or a black doll. And they said, who's the best doll? Who's the doll you want to be friends with? Who's the kindest doll? Who's the funniest doll, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, all the white children said, the white doll's the one with all the good characteristics and the black doll's the bad doll, the naughty doll, the doll we don't want to be friends with. And all the black children said, the white doll's the one with all the great characteristics. The black doll's the doll we don't want to be friends with, who's the nasty one. And this is about internalized discrimination. We see it all, we see it all, off, all too often. 
And we know in, we, there's increasing evidence that this is associated with worse mental health outcomes. So, and there are uh, some papers now showing that there are associations between discrimination and psychosis. And if you adjust for the social disadvantage, which is often structurally driven by the institutional and structural uh, factors, that will almost eliminate the excess rates of psychosis that you see in minority ethnic groups, particularly black people. So if you're from an ethnic minority group, particularly if you are black, you are at higher risk of mental ill health, including psychosis. That risk is increased with biological factors, such as maternal exposure to viruses, poor perinatal care and substance use. But the excess rates are also likely related to social disadvantage and discrimination, including racism. And that discrimination is likely to be structural, institutional and internalised. It's not overt and therefore its impact is easily missed. I'm going to hand over to Dawn because I've taken far too much time. Thank you. Thank you, Lada. Thank you. Tough act to follow as always. Um, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to add my slides now and hopefully people can see them. Yeah. Okay, so it's, um, it's my pleasure and my privilege actually to be leading a team of researchers who are doing work in this area to address some of these issues that, that Laddie has already outlined. I know people have been coming in um, throughout the meeting, so I'm just going to put a couple of slides up that tell us why um, Kathy, and I'll explain what Kathy is in a moment, why it's needed. So as Laddie's all already outlined, um, the, there, are, there are really high rates of diagnosis, and I'm always very careful to say that the high rates of diagnosis among Black people, um, Black and mixed heritage people with psychosis and related schizophrenia, sorry, with schizophrenia related psychoses. And I'm very conscious of saying it's, it's the rates of diagnosis for the reasons that Nadia has already outlined, that there is still some ongoing controversy about the extent to which um, you know, other factors might affect the way the rate at which people are diagnosed and the fact that we know that in Africa in the Caribbean and other places where black people live where they are in the majority and not the minority we don't have that same level of disparity that same rates of diagnosis but in the UK if you're of Caribbean origin, as Ngozi mentioned at the beginning, your risk of being diagnosed with, with schizophrenia in, in particular is about nine times greater than a white British person. And if you're Black African, it's about six times greater. And what we've seen, again, picking up on what Ladder said about trends over time, is that um, Black British, the people born and bred in, in Britain, and, and, and mixed heritage people, that their rates have continued to get worse over time. And alongside that overrepresentation, so you know, if you walk onto um, psychiatric ward at you know, Greater Manchester Mental Health at the Eden Field, and you look and you just see the amount of black men in those units, um, but alongside that overrepresentation in in the more severe end of psychiatric care. The way people get into those services, these so-called negative care pathways, uh, predominate for black people. So now, um, that is already mentioned, more likely to come in under the police. Your risk of being um, compulsorily ad admitted, so that's being sectioned under the Mental Health Act, is about four times greater if you're black. And we're much less likely to get into psychiatric care um, or to be referred for psychological therapies by our GPs. And so the care, once we actually get in, so we've got, we've got worse care pathways, you might have come through directly through the police, you might have come through the prison system, um, but having come into care, um, the, cert, the care that we receive is much more likely to be what's called the coercive end, so more likely to be in um, the psychiatry, inpatient units, so held in seclusion. Um, we know that over time we've seen a lot of um, evidence of control and restraint being disproportionately used, that's being held down, often forcibly, um, to be forcibly injected. And we've seen um, that for some people, for some of us, that results in people dying in services. Okay. I mentioned a lack of access to psychological therapy, and that's along the entire care pathway. So people are much less likely to be offered psychological therapy 
by their GPs. In Many of you would have heard of IAPT, so Increasing Access to Psychological Therapy Services. That seems to have bypassed us. Um, and even when people are in as inpatients, um, and then when we're back in the community, so working within community mental health teams, we're less likely to be offered psychological therapies. Also, um, one of the things that we that we know in terms of the outcomes is that um, you're li we're likely to be in hospital much longer than white people. Now, that may be because we are much more unwell by the time we get there because it takes us longer to get into services. And there used to be, and there still is, a notion that we're hard to reach. But actually, some work that was done in London, in Bristol and in Nottingham um, back in the early 80s, sorry, in the early 20s, showed that on average, black people make about six attempts to get help before they actually get into the system. So it's not that we're hard to reach, but there's something happening um, about that interaction with, with, with um, health professionals that means that we don't get the help that we need at the point that we need it. But also... We know that sometimes people are very fearful and mistrustful of the services, and I'll come on to the, uh, the implications of that in a moment. But just also to say, alongside being about two and a half times, we spend on average two and a half times longer in psychiatric care than white colleagues and white peers, when people are released, we're much more likely to be released on what are called community treatment orders, which means it's, it's a bit like being released on license. So you're released with a certain with a set of conditions. And if you don't adhere to those conditions, you can be brought back into inpatient care. And I've just put this slide here just to show this kind of cycle, which, you know, people are fearful of, of being involved in services. They are, you know, and so that's partly accounts for the delayed access, not entirely, because I've said even when people do try to get help, they don't always get it. Much more severe symptoms by the time people get into hospital, much more coercive care, and um, part of that driven by perceptions of black people within services, longer lengths of stay, and the impact on families of all of this, particularly when families are holding someone at home who's experiencing psychotic symptoms that they might not understand. So the person's experiencing these, having these strange experiences that Laddie outlined before, and the family might not actually understand it. And one of the things that Laddie mentioned was about the onset of you know, the peak period of onset of psychotic symptoms um, is in late teens, early 20s. And so that coincides with a lot of volatility, shall I call it, in families where young people are often, you know, expressing themselves in ways that families find difficult and challenging. Um, for some young people, they, they do start to withdraw. Some start to be more outgoing. It's not uncommon that young people start to experiment with drugs. Um, but we've had some of our service users who said, you know, when they started to experience, for example, hearing voices um, and being, being very frightened of everything and everyone and believing that their parents were poisoning their food or that the, um, the people on the TV were talking to them and they were having to sleep with a knife under the bed because they were frightened they were going to be attacked. What happened for those people was sometimes they were just not sleeping. They were frightened to go to sleep. Um, they were not, they stopped eating. There were all these things that were happening. And so they would, they would, they were trying to keep themselves safe by withdrawing into their bedrooms. But then the families interpreted that as just being extreme adolescent behavior. And for some of those people, what they said was the thing that helped them, in their view, was to start to smoke cannabis. They started to watch this in, in, in jargon is called self-medicating. So they would start smoking. Some of them had never smoked cigarettes even, but they started doing this as a way of trying to help them to manage the symptoms. But obviously then the family sees that and then that gets linked to bad behavior, you know, it's, and so it seems deviant. And we also know that for some families where there are lots of those religious beliefs, uh, people are brought to the imam, to the pastor, to faith leaders um, for prayer. And some um, faith leaders are much more in tuned and are, and are aware um, that this might be a manifestation of something that is not spiritual and can signpost people, but not all. So I'm going to tell you about Kathy, and I'll have to keep saying, I'll tell you what it means in a moment. But talking about the faith communities, um, I'm a member of the New Testament Church of God, a Pentecostal church and um, in, in Old Trafford in, in Manchester. And routinely, we would have people who clearly had mental health difficulties coming to church. And I'm sure that's not that our church is not atypical uh, and neither other faith uh, organisations. And 
we it was very clear that we as a church we didn't really know how to handle it when somebody came to church and maybe they were shouting in the middle of service or whatever was going on and so we started to convene a series of really we call them uh, faith and, and mental health in bme communities um, and really what they were was a place where people who had experienced psychiatric care their family members community um policy makers health providers could come together to talk about specifically this thing around psychosis um, but also wider mental health issues for black people and importantly what we can do about that and after the first conference where we had over 500 people attended over a weekend when we asked people what are the what would you like to see what do you think needs to be done differently what people said that there were two main things one we needed um um, a reduction in what seemed to them to, to, them to be the over-reliance on medication. So people were often not offered anything other than medication. So there's really strong evidence that the best combination of care is for people to have medication to help manage the symptoms and psychological therapy to help them to restore function. And black people were just not being offered that. Um, and then the other thing they said was that families actually don't understand a great deal about what's happening. And we need something about that. So I applied to um, with colleagues to the National Institute for Health Research and got funding to complete two, these two studies, CAFI and CASPA. Um, and CAFI, that CAFI study resulted in this work with families with service users and with health professionals and together we took a standard model of family intervention and we culturally adapted it and we took to explain a bit more about what that meant and we ended up with 10 sessions of of therapy and they uh, they cover obviously the assessment where the therapists would work with the families to you know to learn about the family and um how the person expressing having experiencing psychotic symptoms how that affected the family and so on and then they would go on to um to formulate a plan for how they're going to work together in therapy and an integral part of that that working together is actually understanding what psychosis is a lot of stuff that that Lady explained earlier on and going down into greater detail and some, for some people that will mean debunking the myths that they had about what psychosis is um and then communication which is really important but often as i mentioned earlier on people withdraw they don't know how to explain the things that they're experiencing the families don't know what's going on so there's lack of communication and how we do that but really also importantly how to communicate with the services how if you're a carer um, how and a family member how do you advocate for your um your loved one when they're taken into psychiatric care what are your rights those are the kind of things i wanted to understand um and then how to manage stress within the family um how to develop stronger coping mechanisms and how to problem how to problem solve and then uh, towards the end we focus on how to stop people doing what we call going through what we call a revolving door where they go into hospital they're back out for a little bit the back in hospital and never seem to go uh, to recover, which is really which is what our psychiatric care is supposed to support people with. And so how to stay well and how to continue um, to remain um, outside of psychiatric care. So when we delivered the therapy in, in we had a pilot study and what we did, we ran it with um, 26 families to see whether people would be would, would be willing to try it um, and what they thought of it. And basically the few people who did it of the 26 families that started the cafe therapy in the pilot trial, 24 families completed all 10 sessions. We had really positive feedback um, about it, not just from the services and the families, but also the therapists who were very open in saying that they, there was a lot that they didn't understand. FSMs on here is about is family support members. So all people, irrespective of their background, with serious mental illnesses like bipolar disorder, like psychosis, over time will tend to lose to contact with their families and their social networks. So we decided that one of the things that we would do was we'd open the therapy to those people who might not have contact with their families, including those whose families may be in another part, another part of the UK or indeed another part of the world to be able to get, get therapy by working with what we call family support members. Benefits are on here, so um, just briefly. People, um, service users said 
that they felt that they, for the first time, so many people were understanding their symptoms. They talked about having better function, uh, starting to go back to work, back into study, um, volunteering to do things that was a pre preparation for that. And importantly, better communication for the family members. People talked about, again, understanding the condition, better knowing how to engage with services to support the person who they, they loved and cared for was in services. And for the health professionals, as I said, really beginning to understand what some of the factors were that influenced black people's mental health and how they could better work support them there's a film here i can i'll drop the link to it in the chat afterwards that that tells about the cafe journey from those different perspectives and now we're embarking on so we've taken all that knowledge and went back to the national institute for health research and said we've worked with black people we've created this in, intervention and we uh, and people have tried it They've told us they like it. It's, it's helped them. And so we want to see now whether it, we can we can try it on a bigger scale, because as many of you will be aware, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, is the body that recommends treatment, and they will not recommend it unless it's got what's called a strong evidence base. So we have to demonstrate that this is something um, that, um, that works. So currently we're running a national trial where we are testing out the intervention in the Northwest, in the Midlands, in London and the Southwest. And we want to recruit 404 family units and compare their treatment, treatment and care with, you, with what people would usually receive in services. And this is what we want to do. We want to um, use CAFI to really improve people's access to psychological therapy, but importantly, psychological therapy that's culturally appropriate, culturally informed, something that's co-created by people, um, improve families' ability to support recovery and engagement with mental health services. Really important when we ask people, what are the, what are the, what's the main outcome that you want? They said it's relapse, that's, that's becoming unwell again, and readmission reduction so that's our primary outcome for our study um, and then to improve people's support networks and one of the ways we can do that is through these family support members so who can take part so people who are sub-saharan african and caribbean descent so including people who are black british um, african caribbean um, mixed heritage as long as you have a parent or a grandparent from sub-saharan africa um, then you can take part um, you've got to have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or a related psychosis and be over 14 because 14 is the age at which people go into what are called early intervention services and you have to also be able to consent to take part. For the family members, you need to be a relative of somebody who is, uh, is of, of sub-Saharan or Caribbean origin, but you yourself don't have to be black because obviously we have family members, we have families who are mixed, so it's really important that those people can take part as well. Um, and again, have to have capacity to, to consent. And family support members. So if you're a service user and you want to take part, but for whatever reason, you know, you're not able to do so with your family, you can nominate somebody. So you can nominate a close friend, you can nominate a trusted person like your faith leader or your key worker in the pilot study. Some people took part with their care coordinator. But if that's not an option for you, then we can. We've what we've done is that we've recruited people who are um, and trained, given some training, and we can. Um, and I can explain a bit more about that later. Um, and you can then you can work with one of these service one of these allocated family support members. So since we're all gathered here today, I'm going to ask you how can you how can you help? I'm sure I'm hoping that's what some of you are thinking. How can you help? So first of all, you can tell people about CAFI, and CAFI stands for Culturally Adapted Family Intervention. You can consider taking part um, as a service user, and 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 with your um, your your if you're a service user, or if you're a family member of a service user, and we're now recruiting in the northwest, as I said, so. Um, people who are in, in contact with services in Pennine Care or in Greater Manchester, in the Midlands, so that's um, Birmingham and Solihull or Coventry, um, um, Warwickshire Partnership in London, um, SLAM, South London and Morsley, where Dr um, Smith works, um, and also um, Barnet, Harry, um, Barnet, Barnet, Enfield and Haringey, and we're also looking to now to bring in South West London and St George's, and in the South West it's um, Southampton. So, yeah, if you're service users, we're recruiting people to try out the therapy, service users and family members and family support members. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can get in touch about that. 
And importantly, we need a group. Well, we, 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 with the other study, we had a research advisory group. So people from community, people with lived experience who want to help us to make sure that the therapy is, is being delivered appropriately, that the research, not the therapy, that the research is being delivered appropriately. We're also recruiting therapists, lead therapists, co-therapists. So again, if you've got appropriate training and you're interested, and then there are other opportunities, it's really important to me, to the wider team, that we open opportunities. You know, we still have an underrepresentation of black people in research as researchers. Um, so we're really wanting to give people some opportunities to improve their research skills. We've used with in the, in the pilot study, we also gave people the opportunities um, with, through CAFI and some of those people have gone on to be to do their clinical psychology training um, and so on. And in Manchester also, um, one of the things I should have said is that normally the therapy is delivered face to face. But during lockdown, what we did was that we got some more money from that Institute for Health Research and we've developed a digital option so that you can take plate, you can do it remotely. And so um, what we're also looking to recruit are what we call digital navigators. So that's people who can help service users and their families manage getting online. Because what we're going to do is to give people tablets um, so that they can take part if they don't have those devices themselves. That's just to show you um, where all the, where the places where the study is at the moment. And um, in Manchester, um, the team is myself, um, Shanita, who's very new to the team, Lauren and Tom. Um, and as I say, there's information there about how you can get in touch with us. Um, and that's it. Thank you. And over to you for any questions. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Dawn, and uh, Laddie as well. So what I'd like to do is just invite, we've had lo and quite a lot of questions as you'd expect, because this is a topic that garners lots of interest. Uh, and I'm really pleased that you've been able to share your um, clinical experience with LADE and what we're doing about it as well. Um, can you just, uh, team, can you also spotlight LADE as well? Because we've got lots of clinical questions as well. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to try and group the questions. For those of you that have got your hands up, it'd be much better if you can put your questions in the chat because I find that very often you have similar questions and I can group them. Um, so one of the things I wanted to start off by asking, um, that's come up and I've had some private messages to me as well, is that the diagnosis has been, what you've said is that there are a lot, quite a lot of people diagnosed, but that doesn't mean that they actually have the disease. And one of the things that Lade said was, it was out of keeping psychosis, out of keeping with your cultural and educational um, background in a sense. So since you've got people who are living in the UK, it, it, is that a big factor? And now that we have more black psychiatrists, black researchers, has that made a difference? Because you're, you're looking after black people. And we know we've had quite a lot of um, research studies that have shown that if you have people from your background looking after you, that they're more likely to give you a, a, the right diagnosis. So I'll put that to Lade. You're on mute. Oh, you need to be unmuted. Tim, can you unmute Lade? Thank you, thank you. So um, I need to tell you, and this is something that was a bit difficult for me to accept, that uh, the evidence is that it's, it, it doesn't matter who you are in terms of whether you're black, white, whether you are completely in au fait with this or not. Um, the evidence seems to be that uh, if you're a black psychiatrist, uh, if someone has a true psychosis, you st that person's gonna get that diagnosis. Yeah. And that's important. So the evidence is that being black or white or Asian, whatever, doesn't seem to make a difference to the diagnosis that you get. And that was the Fred Hickling work. And he was a Jamaican psychiatrist who looked at this. And he was he went into this thinking that this was about the way psychiatrists diagnose things. And that and we did some work on that. That's not that's not the issue really here. The second thing is that although once someone turns up to services, they're often in extremists. And I think I saw something in the chat about, you know, people being having a long duration of not being treated. And so by the time they come in, they're at the stage where the, by the time they come to service, they're at the stage of really, really, really need to have treatment. The question, and this is the thing that I have, is we know more about psychosis now, and we know that it's this isn't the, the evidence is it's not simply about some kind of 
uh, genetic or biological process. What we know is that a lot of trauma, that we know that trauma is important and social disadvantage is important. And black communities are much more likely to be exposed to trauma and social disadvantage. And it's looking increasingly like that that, that excess trauma and social disadvantage increases the likelihood of number one mental health problems and probably also increases the likelihood of psychosis as well. The question is, and this is something that we're only starting to look at now, um, whether it would count as a true psychosis, you know, mm. and, and whether it's a, if you like, a kind of quasi-psychosis. So for example, you can get certain disorders like complex PTSD in which people develop, uh, you know, you can certainly have hallucinations, certain types of hallucinations, and certainly you can become really quite paranoid and it might be that actually what we're seeing, and, and that certainly has it is, it is brought about by pretty obvious recurrent trauma when people are younger. And so one of the questions that I have is not that people aren't presenting with psychotic syndrome. Remember, it's just a descriptive term, mm -hmm. but that the type of psychosis is actually more a trauma related psychosis. And that's the important thing. And, and it's unfortunate that people, um, you know, the term psychosis is such, it's such negative connotations that it means that people immediately recoil from it. And it means that you can't investigate some of the things as carefully as we need to. And I think that that 40 years of arguing about it has meant that we've missed the important thing, which is something's going on that means that people are in distress and we need to find out what it is. And I think that the, impact of trauma and social disadvantage in black communities has been wholly underestimated. Can I just add to that, that? I think that one of the things that we're beginning to talk about now, which we haven't for, well, we have maybe in our communities, but is, is the trauma of racism, is racism as trauma. So, you know, I think for a long time, trauma has been seen as being, you know, violence of, of a different kind, but actually, all the people that we've talked about throughout our journey, well, the cafe journey, I don't think any of the service users that we've talked about, talked with, have ever not said that racism in, played a part in their becoming unwell. How you do the research to demonstrate that may be another thing, but everybody has a perception they talk about from being at school, being racialized in the playground and in the classroom by teachers. They talk about being school children, being stopped and searched by the police on the way to school. They talk about it throughout the entire life course and then in the, work, in the workplace and in housing and in every area of life and how emanating that is on people's mental health. So I think, um, as Lada says, you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming for the influence of social factors um, as well as, as, as other things. So I think it's really important that we, we, we look at that. And the mere fact that you've got um, the Howard Mentzer book that she mentioned about how people have reframed schizophrenia. Um, I think we have to take that on board as well, that, you know, it, it has been used not just in the UK, um, but elsewhere it seems disproportionate amongst certain groups and it's still used in some countries to actually incarcerate people who've got politically dissident views, for example. Um, so it's, it's complex. It's very complex. In fact, when after Laddie presented, I, I sat here feeling really despondent about, you know, and then you presented what we're doing about it because that was going to be my question. So what do we do? And the fact that we have this research and we will, for, we will share the slides for anybody that wants them and so that people can get involved because it does seem as if that, that that's what we need to be doing, looking at things that we can do. I think we shouldn't underestimate the impact of societal um, problems and the impact of that on, on mental health. Lade, do you think, what do you think, if, you, if that study with the dolls was repeated today, do you think it would have been? It has been. Has it been repeated? Several times, you can get it online, just put in the black doll, white doll experiment, even up into the 20s, and it's the same. Team, can you just unmute Dr. Dr. Lade, please, and keep her unmuted? I'll make her a co-host. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, it has been repeated, and um, things aren't as bad, I have to say, things aren't as bad today as they were. But we see this all the time. We see this on us, and this is a thing that about institutional and structural factors. We are all immersed in them, and we don't realise that they're happening. So there's this, you know, there's a classic saying of, uh, you know, two fish swimming along, 
uh, you know, they pass each other. One says to the other, oh, the, the water's choppy today. The other fish says, what water? We don't notice it. You know, a hundred years ago, if you had said, you know, if I said to you, oh, I, I, I'm a female and I'm, I'm a woman, I want to go to, to medical school, become a doctor, you would have laughed in my face because it was so unusual. Now, if someone said the same, oh, well, you know, of your daughter or granddaughter that they wanted to go to medical school, you wouldn't think twice. You think, oh, great, good on her, whatever, because it's just not expected. Right now in, in um, you know, parts of the West Indies, in parts of Africa, people use skin lightening creams. And they use skin lightening creams because they think that somehow having a lighter skin is going to mean that they'll get on more. And the problem is, in some cases, it does. It does, it does yeah. And, and um, you know, and same, similar in India, the lighter your skin, the more advanced you get. And so that's quality. about a structural, inter, uh, literally a collective internalised racism. So we can't I pretend it's not there. On a few weeks ago, and they talked about skin lightening creams and the damage it causes. Yeah. And somebody asked a question about, so what alternative creams can we use? So despite the fact that we talked about how bad it was for your skin and we talked about the, the, the issues with it, what they were looking for was alternatives to the, the, the skin creams that he'd put on the screen that were, were damaging. And I'm going to go to some of the questions and um, we've got some really interesting questions. So this is a question from um, Becky who says, do you see a role for lived experience supporters or experts by experience supporting this area? because she's developing something focused on connecting people with severe mental health illness who have been, have been there and can mentor them. I was going to say absolutely yes. And, you know, as I mentioned, not just the family support members and our research advisory group. So we have in developing CAFE, people with lived experience have been absolutely integral and more and more people now recognising that um, the solutions that we need to develop can't be like the where in times past where people you know academics sat in what we call usually often they call the ivory towers and come up with things we actually need to work with people who have lived experience so um absolutely do get in touch becky certainly in terms of our study but there are lots and lots of opportunities now to get involved in research of all kinds not just mental health but physical health as well because people are realizing how integral that is this question so, is about that, the, the impact of um, the, dag the link between autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia on um, mental health. Let's give that so, to Dr. Laddie. So um, the evidence is that if someone is on the autistic spectrum, um, it, there's an increased risk of developing mental ill health full stop. So in fact, 50% um, of people with a diagnosis of autism are likely to develop mental health problems. And that's important because especially when people get to about kind of puberty onwards, the risk of developing a mental health problem is much higher than it would be um, in, in someone who didn't have, who wasn't on the autistic spectrum. And this ranges from common mental disorders like anxiety and depression right up to, to psychosis. So um, the answer is uh, yes, uh, there is a very, very, very strong link and it's something that needs to be watched watched out for. Um, and also, of course, people when people are on the autistic spectrum, they might manifest their um, you know, problems in a different kind of way. So it's something that has to be watched out for, that this is not simply part of their autism, that they've actually developed an additional problem on top that might need treatment. And really importantly, you know, there is this goes back to Ladis talk and talking about poverty and um and disadvantage and how that links to access to care because if you're middle class if you can afford it you're much more likely to get um, a diagnosis of autism or you know any um, of those neurodevelopment disorders um, than others and some as that is mentioning you know about behaviors and how they could be manifested and what might be seen as being an autist an, an expression of autistic spectrum disorder in a white child in a school might actually be labeled as bad behavior or disinterest or inability to learn for a black child and would, they were treated very differently so this is where it's, it becomes very important that we, that we are able to advocate for ourselves understand what's going on and um, we get more people like um, Dr. L Dr Smith into, into, into the system. Um, someone's asked whether there's a gender difference in the diagnosis of uh, psychiatric disorders and, and psychosis in particular. Um, the full stop when it comes to psychosis uh, 
there is a certainly um particularly severe psychosis severe enduring psychosis like schizophrenia um male men are more have more of higher rates than than women so it's the uh, study done by John McGrath. It, it, it's now been firmly established. It, it's about kind of uh, uh, one point four to one. So about four men and forty percent more likely to um, develop severe and enduring psychosis than women. So there is a gender difference when it comes to um, uh, black people. It's unclear if there is a, a gender difference. But what is clear is that when people come into the system women actually have worse outcomes and that's mm-hmm. in terms of physical health and yeah. ongoing treatment and it's interesting that that's women full stop anyway tend to have um worse, worse. outcomes it seems to be uh less attention paid to the needs of, of women and that's partly to do with the fact that a lot of the research is based on it's, you know, women, it's based on young young men mm-hmm. and then it's extrapolated you know it, it, it's applied to everybody else and of course um you know women will have different needs biologically etc so um, yeah, there are there are differences, um, particularly in terms of uh, rates of disorder, but more than anything in terms of experience and outcomes. And I think just, just just sorry, just in terms of the gender thing, also thinking about the wider context that for a lot of the women, they're also going to you know people are going to have children, and a lot of the women will have children, and so the impact for those children, especially in lone parent families, is that those children are often then. Are exposed to trauma because if their parent, if their mum is, is a lone carer and she's taken into psychiatric services, it means that um, unless she's got family support around her, um, that, that their children, a child or children, are likely to be put into the care system. Um, and that is for all quite a traumatic process. And certainly we've had people who've been involved in CAFE who've told us exactly that's exactly what's happened to them and their children. And then they've seen their children gone on to become involved in the system. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very big... There are so many questions. I'm just going to try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, there's a concern about medication um, and people are asking about the side effects of um, some of the medication that people are asked to take. And there's a concern about whether it's they, they, they should be taking medication. Are there any alternatives to just medication? So just to say that the treatment for mental health problems is usually holistic. So you should be, you know, there I say Dr. Smith, seven, seven or eight uh, steps to getting well and staying well. Medication is important. It's one of the mainstays. You have to find a medication that suits you, that causes minimal side effects. And one of the things that people perhaps aren't so good at doing is that, again, it becomes an argument about medication or not. That's that's not the argument. The argument is about mm. which medication and how do you, how do you, you know, make sure because if you are again back to middle class and pretty, you know, uh, you know, knowledgeable about this, exactly. you will argue. You will argue with your doctor until you get the medication that suits you. You need to have the psychology. Dawn mentioned about um, there, we know that there are uh, different types of psychology that are really particularly useful for psychosis, and that includes psychoeducation, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy for psychosis, cognitive remediation therapy. You need to make sure that um, you allow your family to support you. We, there's evidence around, you know, families that are too hypercritical, over-involved versus families who are able to support you in a meaningful way. And that's how caffeine is really useful. You need to make sure you get a good night's sleep every night. Sleep is so important. If you don't sleep, it's not just the anxiety that makes you not sleep. But if you don't sleep after two or three days of not sleeping, you will start to hallucinate. It's as simple as that. Four days of not sleeping, go and watch... Um, I think it was one of the James Bond films, Casino Royale. He's tortured by, um, you know, sleep deprivation. And after about four or five days, he starts hallucinating. It's well known. You need to eat a healthy diet. Really, really important. A diet that's rich in sunshine. So um, that helps with the mood improving, uh, mood improving um, things like serotonin, dopamine, etc. You can get these from your diet. It's important. You need to also exercise regularly. Regular exercise improves mood by about 10 percent that's pretty significant and and i've mentioned it already stay away from the street drugs if you know you've got a family history and what you don't may not know what the cause of that family history is but whatever it is better just to stay away from the drugs actually if you do especially certain drugs like um cocaine amphetamines cannabis and so those things they are the things that will keep you well it's not about whether you take medication or not it's about all those things together and medication is part of that keeping you keeping you well and keeping you stable thank you dawn your whole your research project is is non-medical intervention isn't it mm-hmm. sense so yes. that but, it, but, but um you know we 
we're not, if people are taking medication, we're not asking them to come off. So yeah. it's not an either or. So people who are on medication will remain on it, but we will we will offer um, caffeine alongside that. Um, and as I say, what we'll compare it with is people who um, who don't receive caffeine. So I'm going to just say that if you're interested in signing up, please please do sign up. And if you because people are randomly allocated to either receiving caffeine or not, and if you're in a group that doesn't get caffeine this time, please don't withdraw because it's really important that we have what's called that control group because we have to be able to compare it with a similar group of people to be able to demonstrate uh, whether caffeine is effective and whether again really importantly for the nice to implement it about the cost it's got to be cost effective as well and we think it will be because it will reduce the number of hospital admissions it will reduce a lot of the social element social care elements around it so we think it will be significantly cheaper than the relatively poor care that people are currently receiving so yes if you if you get allocated to the non cafe arm please don't drop out because we, we need you you're integral to the study um, I was just going to just reflect on if I think all our all our health sessions have an element of making sure that you take some control of your health and that's why these sessions are put on about yeah. having a healthy diet making sure that you sleep properly sleep. exercising but every, I think all our presenters week in week out and if there's nothing else that you hear today if you're here and you're listening just make sure that those essential elements that you can use to take control of your own health that you you do um there's an interesting question here about hearing voices. And I think for most people, when you think about mental health, it's about the psychosis. Um, that's what immediately springs to mind. And as you said, Laddie, lad, is people reject that. It's, it's such a profound diagnosis to have. And so people are saying that uh, there's some questions that people have said that they're hearing voices and they're actually having a spiritual experience, but they've now been diagnosed as having schizophrenia. Do you want to comment on that? Because I, from my understanding, that there's a bit more to having that diagnosis than just hearing voices. Yeah, the, I mean, there really is actually. Hearing voices does mm -hmm. not get your finger make. It doesn't even make psychosis either. I mean, as it happens, every single person will have had that experience of just about to be going to sleep or just waking up and hearing their name called or something like that. That's a hypnagogic hallucination, hypnopompic hallucination. It's really, really common. It's not uncommon at all. Mm -hmm. So hearing voices is on a spectrum. It just happens to be that in schizophrenia there are a number of things that happen there are particular types of delusions there are particular types of um auditory hallucinations certain voices that you'll hear there's also really importantly a particular type of formal thought disorder and there's a whole long list of symptoms that go into the diagnosis of schizophrenia there's no doubt at all some people aren't very good at their jobs and they will diagnose someone as having schizophrenia just because they've heard a voice that's not correct but I will also say that majority of people, um, especially now, are very careful about diagnosis. Our services are stripped to the bone. We are massively under-resourced. We really haven't got the time or inclination to be bringing people into services which we don't need to. And there are lots of reasons why people will hear voices. If you hear voices and it's spiritual experience and that's it, fine. We don't really care. Like I said about Mrs. Jones on, living at 10 Acacia Avenue, she gets on with her life, no problem. We don't mind. The issue is when it starts to interfere with someone's life and it's you, and that's when they, usually their families will bring them to your attention of um, the services or, or whatever. Um, definitely, without a doubt, hearing a voice does not schizophrenia make. I hope that shows the person who's asked the question. But yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, I think the, the only other issue I would relate to that is that um, for some people, some of the some of the mental health people, there is often um, a coupling between voice hearing and particularly when it has religious content. I think they may be less likely to see that as being normalized. But again, it's about the good practice. So I, I certainly know of somebody who, um, a psychiatrist, who then reached out to somebody from a faith tradition is the same as a person who was hearing voices and said, I've been asked to section this person, but I'm not actually sure that this person has psychosis. I think what they're having is a religious experience. Can you go? And so that relationship between faith communities and mental health systems is one which is, I think, is under underutilized. Um, and not just mental health. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. Yeah, I'm just going to say that. It, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, so with other groups, yeah. I think the other way is around as well. First, I've got colleagues who, um, from the Muslim faith, and they go into it, they go into mosques, and they're training up imams to be able to work more holistically with people who are coming to them for help, and to know when to report people on, uh, to signpost people on. 
I was just going to yeah. say it's more it's it's more or less standard practice that you check because you don't know what a person's background is until you get to know them and it is pretty standard practice now that you check with those around them and it's only usually at the point of when someone can be an in extremist and you can't get hold of the people around them that that's where it becomes problematic so one of the big messages is if you know someone who has a problem the earlier they get they can see someone the better yeah because then they're less likely to be an extremist. And this is a really, really important yes. point because it's less likely then that you're going to have a problem whereby they're in extremists, picked up off the street by the police. You can't find who their family are or relatives because they've lost all their wallet and everything else. And that's where people are much, and that's what's happening. People are much more likely to get um, sectioned at that point. You come in at an earlier stage, you talk to somebody, you get to know their families and everything else. You understand a lot more about their background and then you can make a better a better. Um, you know, uh, assessment as to whether or not they really are ill or if this is just part, you know, this is just cultural, this is just a cultural um, expression of some distress. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why our um, criteria for getting onto the study, one of them is age 14, because we really want people to be able to get the talking treatments as early as they can so that they can get their lives back on track. When we did the pilot study, one of the things that was really distressing is seeing how many people had, you know, told us that they started becoming unwell when they were at uni and had to drop out, or when they were in doing their A levels and had to drop out. And 20 years on, they were still they still hadn't got their lives back together. They were still going round and round in services. And I know, you know, if you're if you're fortunate to be cared for by somebody like that, that might not be your experience, but it's an experience for an awful lot of people that look like us. And also, it's about having the confidence in the people who are looking after you. The reasons why we put on these sessions is that we know, and I think somebody's put in the chat that this is akin to his experience in the armed forces where you know that you will reach out to people who are in the armed forces because they understand what you've been through. And what we find with putting on these sessions with our black doctors and researchers is that people know that we understand their experiences. We understand as yeah. black doctors, some of the things that they might be going through and the cultural context of what they've done. So yeah. thank you for coming. I'm just- And, and Gozi, can I, can I just mention something very quickly? Because about, I think he, he said, is there, some, is there any kind of scheme happening? There is a scheme, it's called Choose Psychiatry. I'm gonna urge all of you, please, could you um, uh, talk to your, you know, your family members, your rel you know, relatives, people that you know, young kids who are at school thinking about what am I gonna do, encourage them to go into medicine. And then if they're going to medicine, we will do our best to encourage them to go into psychiatry because we do need more and more, more uh, particularly black doctors, particularly from Caribbean backgrounds, because actually um, we have a, quite a, a significant proportion of black psychiatrists. Um, but and I think about 800 of them, nearly every single one of them is from an African background, mm -hmm. West African background, Nigerian background. Yeah. And that's a great thing but it doesn't mean that's not the same necessarily as being from a Caribbean background. So yeah. please, I'm just going to encourage you to encourage those people that you know to, to come into um, medicine. And if people want to contact me, talk to me about it, I'm very happy to help. Yeah. And similarly with psychology, you know, there are still, there's still psychology is still really, unfortunately, still very, very white. You know, we found that last year when we were looking at the mental health yeah. review. And, you know, a couple of years ago, one of the cohorts at Manchester Uni was entirely white women. There wasn't even a guy on it, let alone anybody of colour. So it, it's it, there is a mountain to climb in terms of getting the kind of care, the care and treatment that we need. So we so can, can, I just, can I just be very clear? There are plenty of doctors from non-white backgrounds it's not an issue for doctors no. but we don't have enough Caribbean psychiatrists psychology is very different psychology is a white subject essentially as is occupational therapy so you don't have to go into medicine but if you know people who are interested in going into um you know psychology doing psychology or occupational therapy we can support with that too and that's particularly problematic because that's where the therapy is and yeah. so the therapists are primarily white and female yeah, and one of the things I should say just before well, we well, go well, up. I'm just, out of time, so I'm just going to round up now, but that's, yeah. that's okay. fantastic. I'll put it in the chat. Um, yeah, but if you put everything in the chat now, that's really good. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I would just, there's just one more question that I cannot let go because I'm a neonatologist. And one of the things you showed was about the early birth linking to mental health. And someone's put with advancement in medicine and in technology, that we now support babies who are born at 22 weeks as well. And how are we going to consider the implications of the strong link between prematurity and mental illness in later life? 
So as a neonatologist, I know that the outcomes for many of these babies, there's some of them that will have some, will have some of these diseases, but there are quite a number that will have really good outcomes. And because of the risk, we cannot stop advancing in this area of technology. You know, I don't get many neonatal questions, so I thought I had to plug that one. If you I think, know, you know, can I, can I just say very quickly, Ngozi, my, my son was born two pounds 10, and he's now a strapping, tall, 23-year-old who's at one of the very best universities in the world, despite all the problems he has as a neonate, as a neonate and he was in oh. special care and all the rest of it. So just to say that, yeah. and thank God for neonatologists thank who you. saved the brain of my son. <laughs> thank you. Um, and we want to encourage as many people who want to enter medicine. Um, Ladi has said that if you want to contact us, uh, I've personally supported at least 10 um, doctors, medical, well, young people who want to do medicine have come through my unit and I've supported them and they're now doctors or medical students. Um, and I agree, the majority of people I see is uh, mainly people from African background. I try as much as possible to have, I'm dual heritage, I've got a West Indian mother and a Nigerian father. So I try as much as possible to try and get as many Caribbean doctors to come. So if you know of any Caribbean doctors who'd like to join us, please let us know. So I'm going to hand over to us our, our um, the CAM team, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you so much. The level of engagement and the number of questions we've had just shows how important this topic was. We started off by looking at the problems and we've come, we ended up by looking at many of the solutions. So thank you so much. Over thank to you. the African team. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Superb. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody uh, for, uh, for today's session. It's been really well attended. Uh, I can see that we've had over 200 people uh, on Zoom, much more, I'm sure, joining us on YouTube and Facebook as we cast to them. So thank you to all the attendees, particular thanks, of course, once again to Dr Ngozi for chairing a fantastic uh, health hour session. Uh, thank you to Professor Edge. Thank you to Dr Smith. Uh, an amazing you know, kind of um, set of insights and some amazing learning for people. As we uh, as we continue with our CATIP uh, Health Hour sessions every uh, every week, don't forget you can access all of the Health Hour content uh, via our YouTube uh, via our Khan YouTube account. So if you've missed anything, go to Khan uh, on YouTube and you'll be able to see all of this session. You'll also be able to see all of the sessions that we've done uh, in the past as well. But if you would like to receive uh, a copy of some of the slides that we've uh, that uh, that our presenters have presented today. Please just drop us an email. Uh, we can uh, if you email us at health at we'll get that to you uh, as quickly as possible. I'd like to just draw attention to some of the events that we've got coming up in the uh, in the next month and a little bit further on if I can uh, if I can please. So if you just bear with me, one second. Uh, on Tuesday, the 26th of uh, April, uh, between 6 and 7.30, we have an event that's uh, Can has an event that's focusing on housing. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about housing pathways, uh, the event will be led by our partners at One Manchester. Uh, please get in touch uh, by emailing us at events at calm.org.uk or alternatively, give us a call on 077 10022 382 for more information on that. We have our uh, Healthy Hearts uh, sessions uh, every week, every Tuesday. The next one is Tuesday the 12th of, uh, 12th of April. It's between 5.30 uh, and 7 um, and 7.30 uh, in the evening. They're a really great session. I've sat in uh, them on themselves. Really great information, keeping your heart healthy and some of the things that you can do around uh, around that to, uh, to improve heart health. Uh, we have Dr. Hibber, and Dr. Alice uh, joining us. Uh, quick uh, 30 minutes physical activity session will follow, led by our, led by our uh, physician uh, and physical instructor, uh, Orlando. So please, if you can, Tuesday the 12th of April, 5.30 to 7.30, uh, join us from that. Uh, we have an ongoing uh, suicide campaign. If you're worried about mental health of someone close to you, uh, you have concerns about uh, uh, if you have suicidal thoughts, you're not alone. CAN recognises that early suicide prevention saves lives, so we are here and the CAN team is here to support you. It's vital to act. You can, again, email us at help at calm.org or alternatively call on 07 
382. We've got those professional counsellors that are there to support you. Please do take advantage of this amazing service that Can provides and get in touch if you have any uh, concerns uh, around uh, around those uh, those issues. The counselling service is there also to provide more broad support for people. And again, the same details, please, and I'll give them to you again, is uh, help at calm.org.uk or call or text us on 07710 022 382. The service is available seven days a week from 9 a.m. in the morning to 9 p.m. in an evening. And our councils will uh, counsellors are greatly experienced. They'll work with and ar around you to, to try and form solutions and to support you uh, with, your, uh, with your mental health needs. We have uh, a family advocacy and supporting service. Again, same thing, can be accessed in exactly the same way, help at can.org and the telephone number that I previously uh, mentioned to you. I wanted to draw attention as well, if we can, to the, uh, our Windrush campaign and our Windrush Day event. It's an important day for the community and marks the arrival of near, nearly 100 members of the community, excuse me, 1,000 members of our community who arrived from the UK for the Caribbean in, uh, from the Caribbean in 1942. We celebrate Windrush Day yearly to commemorate them for their bravery and contributions they have made to the community and our society in general. Please celebrate with us uh, this year. Uh, and we're having an event at the Alexandra Park in Manchester. The event's on Saturday, the 25th of, uh, of June from 12 to 4 o'clock uh, in, uh, in the afternoon. So please do get in touch. Do come along uh, and join us. It'll be a great day. And uh, all of speaking on behalf of all of the canteen, really look forward to seeing as many faces there as uh, as possible. In addition, I wanted to draw attention just to the upcoming uh, health hour events that we've got uh, in the next couple of weeks. We have uh, a focus on adolescent mental health coming up next week, and then following uh, on from there, we have a, a, um, a health hour session that will focus on uh, autism. So please spread the word around you know kind of people and community family and friends work colleagues come along to the uh, to the sessions as you can see from today really informative really quite detailed in terms of some of the things that we are uh, talking about and lots of uh, lots of potential benefit and uh, an impact for the people uh, that we work with uh, and love uh, finally i'd like to uh, mention just the uh, our uh, our partners uh, in the uh, in this program, uh, the partners for Cat Hip are obviously ourselves, which is the Caribbean African Health Network. The details I've given you repeated uh, repeatedly, and I'll I'll follow on with just at the end. We have the Black Health Health Initiative, uh, the Royal Assembly Redeemed Church uh, of God, Rafa International Development Agency. A Croydon BME Forum, of course, and Enfield Caribbean Association. Thank you to all of our fantastic partners that we work with on this uh, uh, on this uh, series, uh, this amazing series uh, of talks that we've been able to provide uh, to people. Um, I think that's uh, about. Uh, I think that's about it from me. Just to finally uh, add that again, Can is an organisation here. And it's here 24, uh, 24 7, seven days a week. If there are issues that you would uh, need uh, support for, please do get in touch. Uh, I'm going to give you that email once again, which is help at calm.org.uk and our telephone number, which is 077 322 If there are any issues that you would like uh, help, and uh, help and support with. And again, finally, just that last uh, appeal. Please make sure that you uh, spread the word about this uh, health hour, um, this regular health hours that we do every Saturday between 11 and 12.15, but also those events that we've talked about uh, as well coming up uh, in April and into the uh, into the summer. Thank you once again for everybody that has attended. Thank you to our fantastic uh, presenters, Professor Edge, Dr. Smith, and our wonderful chair, Dr. Uh, Ngozi. And I uh, will pass it over back to the, uh, the canteen. Thank you again. Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Programme, CAFIP Health Hour.
The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.